I feel obliged in today's session to pay back a debt. A debt that I have at this point a couple of years because when we first discussed the Sukkot holiday, the Festival of Tabernacles, around two years ago, I made a point of saying that everything that we were discussing pertained to the seven days and not the eighth day. So at long last, we need to find an opportunity to speak about that eighth day. And that's the subject of today's discussion, the eighth day beyond the Sukkah and beyond this world. But in order to appreciate what we mean altogether with respect to the eighth day, we should first pay attention to what, at least at first brush, appears to be a glaring contradiction in Scripture. That is, on the one hand, we are well acquainted on manifold planes in Scripture with reference to the three pilgrimage festivals. We find reference to the three pilgrimage festivals first in Exodus chapter 23, where we read in verse 14, three times shall you keep a feast to me in the year. And likewise, capping the presentation in verse 17, three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. The three pilgrimage festivals once again. And likewise, in Exodus chapter 34, I'll note that this is a kind of reestablished covenant following the sin of the golden calf. In Exodus chapter 34, we again find reference to the three pilgrimage festivals in verses 23 and 24, three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel, and indeed at the end of the following verse as well, you shall go up to appear before God your Lord three times in the year. So of course, once again, reference to the three times a year. We'll note that we find reference to three times in the year once again in the recapitulation of the laws of the festivals in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. Three times a year shall all your males appear before God your Lord. Once again, three times a year. And even after the five books of Moses, in describing the offerings brought by King Solomon, in Kings 1, chapter 9, verse 25, we read, And three times a year did Solomon offer burnt offerings and peace offerings upon the altar. Now, admittedly, in Kings, we don't find any explicit identification of what those three times were. But in virtually the same statement, as it appears in Chronicles, we do. In Chronicles 2, in chapter 8, verse 13, we read that King Solomon was offering burnt offerings to God according to the commandment of Moses on the Sabbaths on the new moons, and on the appointed seasons three times in the year, on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Matzot, on the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, and on the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. So we know about these three pilgrimage festivals repeatedly. Of course, there are only three. Now, with respect to the one that is especially relevant this time of year, the Feast of Sukkot, of Tabernacles. There is no ambiguity at all, so it would seem, 
as to its length, its length is seven days. We find this stated explicitly and repeatedly in Leviticus chapter 23, where we read beginning in verse 34, the 15th day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days before God. And again, in verse 36, seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to God. There's a continuation in this verse, and I'm going to get to it shortly, but not yet. But reiterating the theme of specifically seven days, we read verse by verse from verse 39. And on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast to God seven days. Verse 40, and you shall take to yourself on the first day the fruit of the Hadar tree, the citron, and the branches of palm trees, and the myrtle, and the willow, and you shall rejoice before God your Lord seven days. And Likewise, verse 41, and you shall keep it a feast to God seven days in the year. And finally, verse 42, regarding the other major observance of the Feast of Tabernacles, the one that gives it its name, we read, you shall dwell in tabernacles seven days. So, repeatedly, the festival of seven days the observance that pertains to the four species that we weigh is described as rejoicing before God seven days. We dwell in the tabernacles seven days. Seems like a pretty consistent theme when we talk about this holy day. And indeed, we find it identified as a seven-day festival, once again, in Numbers chapter 29, here too. We read about the cycle of the holy days, and in verse 12, referring to the holy day that begins on the 15th day of the seventh month, which is, of course, tabernacles, we read, once again, and you shall keep a feast to God seven days. And likewise, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, which we already noted a few minutes ago, with respect to specifically three pilgrimage festivals, we read in verse 13, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. And again in verse 15, seven days you shall keep a solemn feast to God your Lord in a place that God will choose. Seven days, unambiguously. We'll note that in the description of King Solomon's dedication of the Holy Temple. We read about the seven-day celebration as well. This is something that is noted in Chronicles 2 in chapter 7 in verses 8 and 9, that at that time Solomon kept the feast for seven days. And all Israel with him, a very great congregation. And in the continuation in verse 9, likewise, they kept the consecration of the altar for seven days and the feast for seven days. So again, in his time as well, seven days, the same idea is expressed, albeit somewhat more obliquely, in Kings 1, chapter 8, verse 65. And finally, in the Second Temple period as well, in Nehemiah, in chapter 8, in verse 18, we read, also day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read in the book of the Torah of God, and they kept the feast seven days days.
So in all these instances, Sukkot, one of those three pilgrimage festivals, is seven days, which would seem to leave no room at all for adding an additional day. And yet, despite all these references, to a seven-day holy day is an eighth day as well. Sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? The eighth day of a seven-day festival. But that's what we find. That is, we repeatedly read about this eighth day, starting in Leviticus chapter 23, you know, together with all of those explicit references to seven days, well, still in all, we read in the continuation, the verse that I skipped, of chapter 23, verse 36, after the Torah states, seven days you shall make an offering made by fire to God, we read all of a sudden, on the eighth day shall be a holy gathering. And likewise, in verse 39, after telling us you shall keep a feast to God seven days, we read, on the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Again, it's an eighth day. And of course, this becomes manifestly the case in Numbers in chapter 29, when we read of the special offerings that are brought on each of the days of the Feast of Tabernacles. We read about the offerings that are brought on all seven days. And then beginning in Numbers chapter 29, verse 35, we read about the eighth day. So there's an eighth day of this seven-day holy day. And finally, of course, we should note that there is additionally reference to this eighth day in both the words of Nehemiah, that is, as we've already noted, is the reference to the seven days. Likewise, there's reference to on the eighth day, what is generally translated again as a solemn assembly, after the seven days. That's of course similarly in the description of King Solomon's dedication of the temple, there was reference to the seven days, and there was also reference to the eighth day. That is, again, in Chronicles 2, in chapter 7, on the eighth day, they made, again, the way it's usually translated here, the solemn assembly. So, there's an eighth day. What's this eighth day about? After all, let's appreciate the difficulty that confronts us here. We can't say that this eighth day is simply another festival, completely separate from and divorced from the Feast of Tabernacles of Sukkot, because if that were the case, and we would think of four pilgrimage festivals rather than three. But on the other hand, we can't say it's the eighth day of Sukkot because we've already seen repeatedly Sukkot, Tabernacles, is only seven days long, which inevitably forces us to ask, what is this eighth day all about? What is especially glaring with respect to the observances that we associate with this festival, and of course, inevitably, I'll stress here what we've already seen in Leviticus chapter 23, is that the two principal precepts that we observe on this holy day, the taking of the four species, the palm branches, the citrons, the myrtle, and the willow. Well, what the Torah tells us regarding that in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, is you take them on the first day. 
and you then rejoice before God your Lord seven days. Nothing at all about the eighth day. And likewise, of course, as we saw, we saw regarding dwelling in the tabernacles in verse 42. You shall dwell in them seven days. So, of course, to that extent, it is transparently clear why we can't consider the festival of tabernacles to be eight days long, even if we're talking about some eighth day, in that the observances that pertain to the Feast of Tabernacles just don't apply. We don't dwell in tabernacles on the eighth day. We don't take the four species on the eighth day. It's clearly not part of tabernacles, at least in that sense of the term. But what is it? What are we doing? What is it for? What does it teach us? And of course, at this juncture, I feel compelled to repeat something that you've heard from me on many occasions in the past, that while these holy days are often described as Jewish holidays, I think it's important for us to relate them as biblical holy days, because everyone to whom the Bible speaks, everyone who believes in God's word revealed in the Bible, inevitably must be striving to learn something from these days. Their observance, indeed, is obligatory only for Israel, so the lessons that need to be learned, I think are lessons for everyone who believes in God's word revealed in the Bible to learn. So what are we supposed to learn from this eighth day? Well, besides the negative, that we're not taking the four species and we're not dwelling in tabernacles, there are at least a couple of hints that we can discern in the Torah that inform our understanding of what this day is about. The first point that I feel compelled to share with you brings us back to Numbers chapter 29. Now, admittedly, Numbers chapter 29, at first brush, does not seem to be one of the passages of the Torah that is especially relevant to us today. Because after all, it's about the sacrificial service in the Holy Temple, the special offerings that were brought on each of the Holy Days. Well, we don't have the Holy Temple. It was, as you know, destroyed by the Romans almost 2,000 years ago. And by consequence, we don't engage in any sacrificial service either. So one might posit that the whole endeavor has become a moot point, and there's no point in our considering what Numbers chapter 29 tells us altogether. And I submit we would be very misguided for thinking that. First of all, as a general observation, as we have had occasion to note in the past as well, in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 28, we read, The secret things belong to God our Lord, but those things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this Torah. Meaning that even to the extent that the actual application of these words in practice is for now inaccessible. Every word of the Torah, by definition, is forever. It is, again, as expressed here, to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this Torah. Whether we can practice it at present or not, we do, we internalize, we learn from. And in particular, perhaps, with respect to the sacrificial service, we should note the message 
that emerges in the prophecy of Hosea in chapter 14 in verse 3 I'm focusing upon the last words of the verse we will offer the words of our lips instead of bulls now what does that mean? That means that there comes a time when we're not going to be engaging in the sacrificial service. We're not offering bulls. But we're articulating something. And that, too, pertains to how we serve God with our lips. But, of course, lips without the internalization, that's just lip service. So we need to internalize. And consider, then, what we learn from Numbers chapter 29, even if we're not actually able to observe these precepts in practice today. So on that note, let's consider what we read in Numbers chapter 29. Since the passage is fairly long, I'm abridging for the purposes of our discussion at present. So I'll note that on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, we read that the offerings that are to be brought upon the altar include this in chapter 29 of Numbers, verse 13, 13 bulls, 2 rams, 14 lambs. A tremendous number of sacrifices. Indeed, I can't help but note here, more offerings than are brought on any other holy day as the special offerings that pertain to that day per se. None other like it. There's an additional point that I feel compelled to share that emerges not just from our considering what happens on the first day of Tabernacle, Again, in verse 13, we read about the first day when 13 bulls were brought. In verse 17, regarding the second day, 12 bulls. In verse 20, regarding the third day, 11 bulls. In verse 23, regarding the fourth day, 10 bulls. In verse 26, regarding the fifth day, nine bulls. In verse 29, regarding the sixth day, eight bulls. And in verse 32, regarding the seventh day, seven bulls. Well, by simple arithmetic, we've noted this in the past, that means that over the course of the seven days of Sukkot, the number of bulls brought upon the altar equals 13 plus 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7 equals 70. 70, a very significant number. 70, inevitably, we associate with the number of elders that God bids Moses to gather for the leadership of the nation of Israel in Numbers chapter 11, 70 also emerges as the number of nations, primary nations, descended from Noah. It is also by counting the list of names. But it is also by counting the name. Including Joseph and his family. Very problem skin. Um please watch out for the microphones. Sorry. Who are already in Egypt. So, 
then on these manifold planes, when we consider then these various instances in which we encounter the number 70, the 70 elders, the 70 archetypal nations, the 70 members of Jacob's household, then inevitably we get some kind of a sense of what the number 70 signifies. Something that encompasses the whole picture. The leadership of Israel is intended to include elders who can see things from every possible perspective, obviously. The archetypal nations likewise signify every nuance, every niche that needs to be filled in the world. And to the extent that Jacob and his family represent a kind of microcosm of that, there again, we encounter the number 70. My point being then that when we consider the offerings brought on the seven days of tabernacles, those 70 bulls signify the totality of this world, the whole picture. And there's an emphasis then on the traumatic pluralism. All these different aspects manifest. And again, I reiterate, these days of the Festival of Tabernacles are the days that have more offerings brought on them than on any of the other holy days. And it is then in particularly dramatic contrast that we consider what happens on the eighth day, you know, the day that's not part of Tabernacles, but it's still called the eighth day of Tabernacles, where the description of the offerings in Numbers chapter 29, verse 36, is just one bull, one ram of all the holy days, fewer offerings than any other. What is this supposed to signify? Both that the offerings brought on those seven days are not, as you might think, taking the number 70, dividing it by seven, 10 per day, but a diminishing sequence, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. And that altogether, Tabernacles has this tremendous profusion of offerings, as opposed to the eighth day, it has the fewest of all. Maybe an idea that resonates with the precepts that we have on those seven days of tabernacles. We're dwelling in the tabernacles, we're taking the four species, and then we get to the eighth day, and there are no special precepts, no special mitzvot that are associated with the observance of the eighth day. That's one important hint with respect to the identity of this day. The other is a word that recurs, actually, it appears four times in Scripture with respect to this eighth day. Almost every time that we encounter this eighth day of the holy day, it is described, indeed, using this term, and the term is atzeret. Generally, the word atzeret, near as I can see, in most translations is rendered as assembly, gathering. It's not necessarily the best translation. But I'll note that the term, indeed, occurs with respect to the eighth day in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 36, in Numbers chapter 29, verse 35, in Chronicles 2, chapter 7, verse 9, with respect to King Solomon, and in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 18, with respect to the observance of the holy day and the eighth day in the second temple period, after the return to Zion following the Babylonian exile. In all these instances, we encounter the word atzevet. What does atzevet mean? Well, you are 
undoubtedly already well accustomed to our linguistic analysis in Hebrew, the realization that all authentic Hebrew words derive from three-letter roots. The three-letter root of atzeret is atzol, the final taf for the Hebrew experts among you, is a consequence of the conjugation, the declination of the root. The root letters, again, are ayin sadivesh atzol. What does this root mean? Let's consider the first place that it appears in Scripture. The first place is in Genesis chapter 16, verse 2. The context being Abram and Sarai, who will eventually become known to us as Abraham and Sarah, have already been married for quite some time. It emerges in the verses that follow for 10 years without having had children. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, God has held me back, has stopped me up from bearing children. And by consequence, she proposes to her husband to have children through her handmaid, through Hagar. What's important for our purposes is just a linguistic observation. The word for held me back, stopped me up, detained me, restrained me, atsarani, is a conjugation of the same root, of atsor, of atseret. And indeed, in a similar vein, there are many instances that we can cite here. I'm just going to cite three examples to dramatize the point. When the angel comes to the parents of Samson in announcing his impending birth, so Samson's father, Manoach, in Judges chapter 13, verse 15, says to the angel, I pray you, let us detain you, restrain you, hold you back, stop you, keep you here until we have made ready a kid, a goat, for you. And in the following verse, the angel says to Manoch, even if you detain me, even if you hold me back, I will not eat of your bread. That is, what emerges is that Manoach didn't realize this was an angel of God. But again, for our purposes, we're focusing on the linguistic aspect. The verb for holding back, detaining, restraining, is, again, the same root of atzor, in this case, na'atzra, ta'atzreni. My final example in the book of Samuel, in Samuel 1, chapter 21, Verse 8, that when King David, not yet as king, had come to the city of priests on his way fleeing from King Saul, we read in verse 8, now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day at the Holy Tabernacle, the sanctuary, in Nov, detained, held back, stopped before God. Same word. So, using these linguistic cases as an adequate basis, what we see in all of them is atzeret can mean a day of being detained, of being held back, stopping. Don't go. Don't go. The eighth day. The eighth day on manifold planes is that day that closes the period of holy days. That is, on the most accessible, maybe tangible plane, this is 
the last hurrah, the final celebration before, of course, the winter rains. As you all know, we have here a Mediterranean climate. We don't have rain during the summer months. The first rain of the season took place on Shabbat, just a couple of days ago. It was a little bit early, admittedly, because usually the rains only start after Sukkot, after the Feast of Tabernacles. So the last day of celebration before the rainy season, when the farmers are busy with their farms, and in any case, the weather is not such that people would be traveling about very much. This is the last opportunity for the entire nation to be together in Jerusalem. That's, of course, on the one hand. We could add, additionally, as perhaps a more pointed and deeper implication of this eighth day is there's a whole series of holy days in this month. We've noted this. This month, which is, of course, identified as the seventh month, reckoning from the first month being the month of the Exodus. And we discussed in the past that it seems awfully strange that we call the first day of the seventh month Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. You'd think the beginning of the year would be in the first month, wouldn't you? And as you may recall, the most explicit scriptural basis for our, our identifying the year as beginning in the seventh month is what we read not regarding Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the seventh month, but rather specifically what we read regarding the Feast of Tabernacles. And we read it in Exodus chapter 23, in verse 16, we're enlisting the pilgrimage festivals. We read of the Feast of Ingathering, which is, of course, one of the alternative names of Sukkot, of Tabernacles, which is at the end of the year. At the end of the year. Of course, as we've noted, and as is self-evident to all of us, years are cyclical. When you get to the end of one year, you don't fall off the edge. If one year is ending, the next year is beginning. It is this reference to the Feast of Tabernacles that's happening at year's end that teaches us that it's also year's beginning. So it is specifically at the end of the year that there's this one last stop, hold back, be detained, stay with God this one additional day. This one additional day that isn't part of the routine of the various other holy days with all their attendant commandments and precepts. Stay back one extra day. And to that extent, then, you already get some kind of a sense of this specialness, the eighth day of the seven-day celebration. It's beyond the end. It's beyond the end, but you're still sticking out. And inevitably, that brings me to one additional insight, which is likewise proposed among the biblical scholars pertaining to that designation, Atzeret. Stop. Hold back. In the course of the natural world, we speak all the time of seven. We've noted this at various opportunities in the past. Of course, most glaringly, creation is described in the Bible as seven days. And maybe we should be even more specific here. Six days of creation and the seventh, the Sabbath. 
to Sabbath. Anger is the holiness of time with respect to the six days of the rest of the week. So again, six plus one. The seventh, the totality of the natural world. Spirituality in the natural world. Seven. And then there is the eighth. The eighth that goes beyond the natural world, that transcends the bounds of nature. Where do we encounter the number eight in the Bible? Well, of course, most obviously, we encounter the number eight with respect to the day of circumcision. Circumcision, likewise, is going beyond nature. Nature, after all, is being born as we're born. The circumcision is something more than that. The eighth. Another example, more subtle, but simple arithmetic. The eight vestments of the high priest. The high priest, likewise, beginning with Aaron, is summoned to engage in something that goes beyond mere nature. And he wears eight garments, eight vestments. In addition to these relatively explicit instances of eight in the Bible, we'll note further that we find reference in both Psalm 6, verse 1, and in Psalm 12, verse 1, to the Sheminit, which is generally understood to mean, coming from the Hebrew Shmini, meaning eighth, the eighth string heart. An eight string heart. What was it for? We have an ancient tradition that the harp in the Holy Temple had seven strings. I can't help interjecting here that as undoubtedly many of you are aware, I personally remember learning this in a course I took in Music Humanities when I was a university student, that all of Western music ultimately goes back to the religious music that was produced in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. Seven stringed harp. Well, just consider the musical scale upon which all of Western music is based. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, fi. Seven. So the harp had seven strings. But then there's the eighth. And in the ancient tradition to which I just referred, the eight stringed harp is the harp of the rebuilt temple in the Messianic era. Because, of course, the Messianic era is not merely some incremental addition. It's not part of this world. It is beyond this world. Redeemed. Beyond seven. To cite one additional dimension that is perhaps most apropos with respect to the significance of the number eight, I direct you to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 presents to us a fascinating comparison by implication. The psalm begins by speaking of the grandeur of nature and how the grandeur of nature testifies to the greatness of God. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork Day to day utters speech, and night to night expresses knowledge. The grandeur of the natural world that speechlessly testifies to the greatness of God. That's the way Psalm 19 begins, and that's the way Psalm 19 continues through verse 7. Verse 7 still speaks of sun, the most obvious luminary in the natural world. And beginning in verse 8, the Torah of God is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of God is sure, making wise the simple, and so on. Beginning in verse 8, we speak not about the world of nature, but the realm of the Torah. God's word. God's word. 
is what elevates us beyond nature. And beyond is specifically the number eight, not just seven. There's an additional expression of this that we should note in Psalms, and that pertains to what is, by a very wide margin, the longest chapter in the entire Bible, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 has 176 verses. Why specifically 176? Ah, well, it's a consequence of a very simple arithmetic progression in the Hebrew alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, upon which, of course, the Latin alphabet is based. There are 22 letters. Psalm 119 provides us with an acrostic using each of the letters of the alphabet in extolling the greatness and grandeur of the Torah and of its study. And what sort of acrostic is it? It's an octuple acrostic. That is, each letter of the alphabet is presented eight times in initiating verses in chapter 119. Consider what that implies. When you want to speak about the greatness, the grandeur of the Torah, of God's word, and study, what's the relevant number? The number eight. So it's 22 letters of the alphabet, multiplied by 8, and of course 22 times 8, as you can readily observe, equals 176. But again, going beyond nature, going beyond nature, necessarily brings us into the realm of Torah. And this is perhaps especially germane when one considers the 8th, in the sense of the 8th day of Sukkot. Because, of course, that 8th day that goes beyond the seven days is a day that has historically become not merely the eighth day of a seven-day festival but has acquired an identity an identity of its own as simchat torah the day of rejoicing with the torah a relatively ancient tradition that we complete the cycle of reading through the chapters of the Torah, of the five books of Moses, every year on the eighth day. On the eighth day that necessarily propels us beyond, not just beyond the Sukkah, but beyond this world. A realm in which we don't have any of the particular trappings the tabernacle, the four species, that are, after all, derived from this world. What do we have? We have, as it were, God alone. A verse in Song of Songs that is aptly expounded as alluding to this eighth day. You know, we have an ancient tradition that the Song of Songs, which is a love song, should be taken as a love song of us with God. And in the Song of Songs, in chapter 1, verse 4, we read, Draw me. We say, as it were, to God. We will run after you. The king has brought us into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will praise your love more than wine. Sincerely, they love you. Love story of us with God. In the Hebrew, Nagila Venisnecha Bach. We rejoice and are happy with you. Not with some particular aspect of our this worldly service, not with some tangible material expression, but just rejoicing with God. And maybe I'll add as well that 
with you in the Hebrew, Bach, based upon the rules for numerological equivalent of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, equals 22. So, of course, 22, on the one hand, again intimates the letters of the alphabet that we exalt with all 22 letters of the alphabet with which God's word, the Torah, is written. But maybe also 22 by simple arithmetic, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles is the 15th of the seventh month. And what's the date? of the eighth day, the eighth day, necessarily, is number 22. On the 22nd, we rejoice, not with this worldly trappings, but, as it were, with God himself. That, maybe more than anything else, gives us a sense of the identity of this eighth day, that is, on the one hand, is it entirely a separate and distinct festival? No, it's not. There are only three major pilgrimage festivals. And to that extent, this is the eighth day, which implies that it has some kind of connection with the Feast of Tabernacles that precedes it. But it's not part of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the Feast of Tabernacles in seven days. Uh, but you can only really appreciate the significance of the eighth day when you compare it with what we've been doing the seven previous days on the Feast of Tabernacles, where again, we have all these offerings, and we have the tabernacle, and we have the four species, and we come into the world of the eighth day, and it is, again, I remind you, an atzeret, a day of holding back, detaining yourself, staying, not with any of the particular trappings, staying with God. This, as explicit scriptural references to the identity of this eighth day, would by itself suffice, except that there's one additional dimension that I feel compelled to share with you as well. And this final dimension brings us the prophecy of Haggai. Haggai, I'll remind you, one of the 12 so-called minor prophets, minor simply in the scope, the size of their prophecies, Haggai was one of the three prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, who prophesied in the second temple period. And in Haggai, we read in chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Yehotzadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this house, the holy temple, in its first glory? The first temple, before it had been destroyed, the old folks had, as we've read likewise in the book of Ezra. And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes? It's nothing. Because the second temple, when it was first built, didn't hold a candle to the first temple in its glory. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel says God, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Yon, Sadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says God, and work. For I am with you, says the God of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Fear not. For thus says the God of hosts, yet again, in just a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all the nations. And the costliest things of all the nations will come. Will come here. Trust me. To this temple. And I will fill this house 
temple. With glory, says the God of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the God of hosts. The glory of this latter house, this latter temple, will be greater than that of the former, of the first temple, says the God of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the God of hosts. Rousing words, but you would be excused for wondering why in the world I'm sharing these words with you specifically now. Ah, because I began reading from verse 2. Maybe I should have begun reading from verse 1. Verse 1 tells us this prophecy takes place in the seventh month on the 21st day of the month. It was then that the word of God came to the prophet Haggai. The 21st day of the seventh month in the Hebrew calendar, that is today. It is the eve of the eighth day. It's the seventh day. It is on that seventh day that the prophet sees in anticipation what perhaps we could best describe as the world of the eighth day. When God's house is rebuilt and filled with glory, with God's presence. I can't help but note that that closeness, that intimacy with God that had been and was lost. There is, I must admit, a rather somber note that needs to be borne in mind in reading these prophecies. It didn't happen. The second temple never acquired that status that had been designated by the prophets. Why not? A good question. Perhaps the answer lies in the lethargy, the recalcitrance of the exiles in returning home from Babylon after the Babylonian exile. Be that as it may, it is, of course, axiomatic for us and definitively expressed in Isaiah in chapter 55 in verses 10 and 11. As the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I have designated and it shall prosper in that for which I sent it. God's word always, ultimately, is fulfilled. So, this prophecy of Haggai from today, from the eve of the eighth, still awaits its complete fulfillment. Its complete fulfillment when we return to God and God returns to us. And every year, as we emerge from the seven days of tabernacles to the eighth Atzeret. Just with God. We go beyond the sukkah. We go beyond the four species. We go beyond everything. We go beyond the world. We go beyond the world and become one. The source of us and everything in God. Chag Sameach. And God bless you.